All right. Well, good. I was hoping for an intimate group, so this is great. Um, let's get started. So we've got everyone here. Um, this is the Drupal.org infrastructure panel. Um, I'm Rudy, or Basic, uh, Neil Drum, Hi. and Ryan down at the end. I'm Mixologic. And Tatiana's on her way, and I think everyone knows Tatiana, but she'll be the person that comes late. Um, so here's kind of our agenda. It's, it's all infrastructure. Um, there's an overview of the infrastructure, and you kind of thought it would be a good idea to touch on kind of like production infrastructure history just to see kind of like where it, where it started. Um, the keynote in Los Angeles kind of covered some of the history there with like how the project moved to the open source lab and stuff like that. So to kind of give like a infrastructure level like look at what that was and why it happened. Um, and then kind of continue on to like where we are today with a full-time team of staff and a panel of people that do infrastructure stuff. Um, and then also the pre-production infrastructure history. So that's um, kind of the same thing. Like there wasn't pre-production infrastructure for a very long time and then we built some and we have a lot more work to do there. So I'm um, hoping to get some some feedback on that and kind of plans for that. And, and also on the production infrastructure kind of like next steps. If, you know, I, I think that's more defined. The pre-production infrastructure is not as defined. Um, so once we get through that, um, that, that'll be me mostly covering that. And then a uh, Drupal CI overview, a combination of Neil and, and Ryan, um, talking about the, how Drupal CI's Drupal.org integration works, um, how the dispatcher and what the dispatcher is, how that works, and how the test runner that's actually like putting the testing together, like this is MySQL 5.5 and PHP 5.6, and launching the containers and managing that sort of testing part. How that all works, how it ties together, what it looks like in the infrastructure. And then once that's done, uh, there's less GIFs. Um, and we kind of talk about kind of our infrastructure plan for production and uh, where we're going next and kind of what's, what's in queue for that. So let's, let's get started. Um, kind of already alluded to this, but we have come a long way. Um, Drupal's a pretty mature project now. Um, you know, and it started in a seemed like it started in a basement. I don't quite know where it was in Europe, but it was in Europe, and then it moved to the open source lab at Oregon State University, uh, about an hour and a half south of Portland. Um, and once it got there, there was a lot to do. Like, there wasn't really an architecture. The site was still not quite stable. Um, we've come a long way in, like, making architecture changes easier to do now, uh, configuration management. Um, we have a budget to buy servers, that helps. Um, and then, you know, like the, the key things are stability, security, and performance are kind of like, that's what we want to continue building um, with the infrastructure. So a long time ago in Europe, Drupal got popular. And the site went offline. And like before, before crowdfunding was like a buzzword thing, like the community came together and funded purchasing servers and the open source lab was also kind of a new thing and provided like very subsidized hosting for open source projects. And so the, the servers got shipped there, the site got transferred over, the data got moved and we built something. Um, and there were a few of us helping, not myself actually, uh, Narayan Newton who wasn't able to make it to the, to the conference, um, Neil Drum, uh, myself to some extent after kind of the initial crazy, but we need to fix fast. So it's like, okay, what do we do? What does the open source lab have that we can utilize? How do we, how do we move the site over and, you know, keep it running with volunteer kind of community support on the infrastructure? So we, yeah, I don't think I existed then. Oh, maybe you didn't. It was no. Gerhard kind yeah. of like helping with our data migration. And, uh, Kiartan. Right. And oh, Eric Searcy was another open source yeah. lab. A student. So there were two students, um, Eric and Orion at the Open Source Lab, that put together this architecture. Like, this is how we could scale Drupal.org, keep it online. The Open Source Lab had a pair of load balancers that they could they could use that could be part of that. Um, and then, you know, we had some servers that were 
purchased with that kind of crowdfunding stuff and donated by Sun, Microsystems, and kind of built this architecture. So we had four web nodes. One of them had NFS on it and kind of shared the web root with the rest of the uh, web nodes. Load balancers did just round robin load balancing. Uh, Drupal.org was like really big in comparison to kind of the subsites that existed at the time. So there were four database servers. Uh, Drupal.org's database was kind of prone to failure or the subsites were, you know, running queries, interacting with each other in ways that were like Drupal.org would go offline if a subsite got popular or vice versa. Drupal.org was getting hit, subsite would go offline. So there were two separate kind of database clusters uh, in like a high availability replication. So that's, that's where we kind of ended up, and we were like that for a long time. Um, it wasn't enough. It was sort of like we, we thought we were building that brick house or you know, something out of brick, and it, it, it worked, but it kind of started to fall over. There, there, wasn't, there wasn't enough control over kind of what we were doing, and Drupal was growing. The amount of traffic we were handling was pretty insane. Um, today, you know, like updates traffic alone is about 12 to 14 terabytes a month, just serving XML updates for Drupal sites. So around 2011, when the Drupal.org redesign uh, kind of went underway, the Drupal Association had contract work and contractors come in, and myself and Orion uh, contracted through Tag1, uh, Neil contacting through himself, and a bunch of other people um, kind of working on like adding solar to Drupal.org, redesigning the site. We use this as an opportunity to kind of like enforce a better, sort of more stable infrastructure that would be more sustainable long term. So we got our own load balancers. So we no longer were using the OSL load balancers. Uh, we got some new database hardware. Um, that kind of didn't change. Like that, they were super over spec when they got purchased, so they, they were still working. So there were some things that like were still working, some things that weren't. Um, NFS on WW1 was kind of like a weird one-off, like WW1 we would treat differently than the other web nodes, and if it went offline, if we did some upgrade or something there, like they needed to reboot for like a security issue, and like NFS would go offline, we had to take the site offline, and it was a big, a big pain. So we got uh, two media servers that serve up the NFS and high availability, so there was failover for NFS, and we could you know, swap one out, move back and forth. And uh, we also started using uh, Jenkins to run all of the sort of like, well, Hudson at the time, to run all of like the cron jobs and kind of drush commands and things to run the sites. So we had like an interface to do that, to add them uh, in a way that didn't require like Neil to log into a server and edit the cron table or the cron tab. Um, so util got added. Um, Git, the Git migration ended up happening on Util because it was kind of the only server that we had to put it on. Um, solar got added, so two solar servers. So all of these things got added. We needed a way to sort of control the software and stuff. We had CF Engine through the OSL, but we had a very dedicated team of volunteers that were doing a lot of work and contractors that were doing a lot of work that didn't have access to CF Engine. So we started using Puppet and uh, Puppet got kind of merged in in addition to CF Engine, and that's been an ongoing project to sort of decouple that CF Engine configuration management uh, from our Puppet management. And that's, I'd say, like 95% complete at this point. Uh, so that, that's 2011, still run by volunteers. And it worked for a long time. Like, it was, it was working. It wasn't the best. We just kind of let it, let it run, and, like, when we had time to fix things or upgrade things as volunteers, we would do it. But today we have a lot more, and I'm now infrastructure manager at the Drupal Association, and I was able to hire Ryan and Archie, who's not here, uh, to also work on infrastructure. So we have you know three people working full time now on kind of bettering the production infrastructure, pre-production infrastructure, and things like Drupal CI. So we've s kind of slowly, iteratively been replacing components and and working on all of these projects to build kind of an even more stable, more secure, more performant Drupal.org. Um, so the load balancers now are, you know, they're, they're running FreeBSD and HA proxy. It's very simple um, and kind of something we can use consistently across uh, different servers and services. Um, the web nodes are all web nodes. We now have a Jenkins node that is actually a 
basically a web node without Apache or Varnish or any of the web stack. It's just a web node with like the ability to run Josh commands. Uh, so that's locked down and separated from the other web nodes. So like there's no Jenkins has a lot of power, like as it as its user, its vendor user that we run Jenkins as can do a lot of things to the site. We wanted to have it separate, so like the web nodes were just serving web traffic, and Jenkins could only do things in the Jenkins node. And we have some like pretty strict uh, SE Linux and GR security policy on that box that's more enforcing than it is on the web nodes, so that Jenkins doesn't go crazy because it's kind of a robot. So I'm trying to prevent that. Um, yeah, but mostly it's running Drush commands uh, and, you know, the Drush uh, core cron and things like that. Um, and some other changes there. Um, so we have two new database servers. Um, the database servers got replaced, like, last year, um, and those were the same ones that got purchased way, 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 way back. And uh, a lot of the kind of performance improvement that we saw on Drupal.org was from that replacement. It's just newer, we need newer hardware. Uh, and they're super over spec so they're <clears throat> Huge. Barely, barely doing anything now um, in comparison to like how, how loaded down the previous ones were. So that's, that's good. Um, some more changes that we want to do, or that we have done, uh, get one and get two, so we have highly available get.drupal.org now. We didn't have that uh, <clears throat> previously, which was problematic for the same reason that like NFS on WW1 was problematic. If we needed to upgrade something on util, git and reboot, you know, git would go offline. Um, we're also using private IPs in a lot of places. Um, one of the things that the OSL still provides us is a lot of networking support. So um, we don't have, we have public and private IPs on most of our production infrastructure. And one of the things we're trying to do is get away from using public IPs on anything really but the load balancers and some gateway servers or some, something like that to lock those down and just network level security uh, for the stack. So we've been moving things like Solar, MediaOne, um, and other pieces of infrastructure to use private IPs now um, and then eventually like remove those public IPs completely so we can start locking down the stack. <clears throat> so that's kind of what we're going for is stability. Like we needed it, we needed it stable. We can do that now. Um, performance, like we, we don't want to have to deal with performance things. Like we just let them, the site gets more, <laughs> more load on the site means we don't have to do anything. Uh, the, you know, the keynote, the Dries note in the past, the Drupal cons has been like crazy, like Narayan and I in a room together trying to fix the database servers or fix problems. The Dries note, this year was I was actually like eating breakfast, like I didn't have to worry about it. It was fantastic. And then security. Finally, we've done a lot of things. There's still a lot to do with security, um, but we're we're running SE Linux everywhere. We're enforcing policy everywhere. Uh, production's running uh, GR security like hardened kernels on well. Yeah, pretty much everything. I'm not going to tell you which thing isn't running it right now, but. <laughs> <clears throat> nope. <laughs> I'm going to got to take those private IP or public IPs offline and that'll help. Um, so tomorrow we want, I kind of already alluded to this, right, is these gateway servers down here doing routing. So like we need to do routing, uh, running snort so we can do, you know, analysis of what is going out, what's going in, who's, who's doing what, and for things that need one-to-one -one NATs, like Git right now is kind of, it's easier to do a one-to-one NAT for the Git stuff, so it'll still have sort of a public IP. Um, we can do that with the gateway servers and and rip everything off else off the public network, which will be huge for uh, security uh, just from the network layer. And that's kind of been a key, I mean. Well, I was just gonna say, where, where did util go? <clears throat> yeah, that's the next thing. <laughs> so util is another, it, it, was, it served a really good purpose when it was just volunteers and we didn't have servers to run things on. Virtualization wasn't really a thing yet. Um, we now have vm1.drupal.org, which is a really beefy machine that we have for virtualizing things that are not, not 
critical production services, they can go down. We, we don't need to care as much about their, their uptime. So uh, mailman for the mailing list, um, does anyone know? Like, does anyone use those yeah, here? Use. You use them? The security team uses them. There's a few lists that are still active. Um, so we, we do maintain mailman and post fix and some, some mailing stuff there. So being able to move that off util, throw on the virtual machine. Um, Puppet, same thing. It's running on a OSL virtual machine right now. We'd, we'd like to move that onto our, our infrastructure. Um, and then Jenkins also is running on util right now. So all uh, Mailman and, and Jenkins were both running on util. Puppet was not. But now we have a, a machine that we can basically put them all on. Um, and that gets kind of that, that gives us a place to do things like, oh, maybe we want to run our own LDAP server someday. We can put it on VM1. Um, and that's, that's sort of the direction um, that we're trying to go and that I see us going. Um, and any comments, questions on kind of, the, it, is it this happy? <laughs> Will it be this? I don't know. Can I still do my work on it? So a shell server would probably be the uh, question was uh, if he can still use util. Uh, we'll probably scrap it and send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you can you can keep using it. <laughs> uh, how, how many how many years old is it? Yeah, uh, <laughs> right, right. So. <laughs> depending on, so going back a slide, so depending on what the gateway servers run, um, we're, we're thinking PFSense there because it's pretty standard, or it could be FreeBSD, one of the two. Um, we would either set up a shell, like the ability to do shell server stuff there, or another VM that's like shell.drupal.org where like it's a VM, it's not really critical production infrastructure, but you know 99% of the time it'll be up kind of thing. So, but that is a thing I can add to this little image. But yeah, no, that's a great, thank you. That's, that's good. Um, any other, like, thoughts, questions? Yeah, so a uh, question was Jenkins security, how do we secure it? Um, that is actually running on localhost only. So it's only listening on localhost on util. So to use it, uh, there's a page somewhere on Drupal.org that kind of has the details, but it's an SSH tunnel to util, uh, like port forwarding that 8080 port that it's running on to your local machine. Then you log in, and it's linked up with the kind of LDAP that we're running now. Um, so your LDAP account, if you have one, um, you use that to log into Jenkins. And then from there, we use like project-based security in Jenkins so that we can, lo certain people have access to certain projects, certain people don't. Okay, so, so if we start logging Yes, so the SSH command there would be a little tricky, but. <laughs> Could you set it up so that Jenkins was listening not on localhost in that case, and then only allowed internal IDs, and you could tunnel to there, and then go. Yeah, so the, the first question was, you know, how do we how do we get to Jenkins when it's on a private network, uh, and you have to log in through gateway one, um, and. Uh, one suggestion is, well, on a private network, do we need to care about Jenkins running on the private IP? Probably not. Um, that, that would be an easy kind of solution there where, like, if, if you're logged into, if you're doing a single forward from Gateway 1 to, like, Jenkins.drupal.org or Drupal out back, um, yeah, it would just be a single forward in that case. That's, that's a good idea. Um, but haven't, yeah, I haven't thought too much about that piece. I mean, do, do you guys have any thoughts? Nope. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that works. I mean, like, we wouldn't really need to have it only listening on localhost once you can't get to it anyways. That's yeah. The, that's I, the main value of that. Yeah. Yeah. I would yeah. say you yeah. probably still want to lock it down so that you don't have it broadcasting. I mean, the web heads don't need to access the exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a VPN could be an option, maybe. Um, another way we could, you know, VPN certain people only had access to certain internal IPs sort of thing, and, and we could do it that way too. Um, SSH is definitely easier on my end to set up. Um, 
but nothing wrong with the VPN. So that could be like a tomorrow, tomorrow thing. So uh, any other thoughts or questions before we move on to pre-production? Cool. Um, so pre-production infrastructure history, um, oh, it's kind uh, of. I was just gonna, sorry. Did, yeah. did you wanna talk about the CDNs around this cloud at all? Because as far as like updates and static one and static two, yes. Uh, well, I will touch on that in the kind of the what's next and what's on our pipeline because it's kind of it's parts of that I cover there. Um, but Brandon, so static one and static two were the project XML uh, Yeah, actually, I didn't cover static one, static two. So those, yeah, that's um, updates and FTP traffic. So FTP being Drupal downloads over HTTP, which is a little confusing, um, but it's ftp.drupal.org. That was hosted by the Open Source Lab on their FTP mirrors, and we had the hardware and had some constraints with their system where, uh, like, pushing a release to the FTP infrastructure would be, you know, pretty instant. Like, it would get packaged, uh, a job would run and sync it to the mirror, and then their mirrors would have to sync out to the like other two mirrors, and that process uh, transferring from their mirror system to the other two like Chicago and New York mirrors would take up to like 45 minutes to an hour sometimes, and sometimes it broke, and that was becoming problematic with like security updates, security releases that were announced, packaged, pushed out, and then taking an hour to get actually get. Um, across the mirrors, where you know some people could see that like Drupal 7.37 got released because they were hitting the uh, Oregon mirror because they're on the West Coast. Someone in Chicago or New York couldn't get it. Um, so we moved that to uh, static one, static two. Those are just like web nodes, except they don't run PHP. They just run Nginx. They serve static files. Um, that, that's been working uh, very well. Those are linked uh, to Fastly on the front end. So Fastly is actually uh, doing all the CDN like stuff for those. They send up a you know 365 day like cache me for that long for all the files, and then we do some smart caching, uh, purging stuff that Neil wrote um, for updates traffic for packaging. Um, when a new release comes out, purge the CDN if it had cache day 404 or something like that for that release and do a soft fetch in the background and, and serve it up. And that's taken uh, around uh, updates, updates is about 12 terabytes a month and FTP is around like four to six, depending on, on the month. Um, and our origins now, like don't, static one, static two, hardly see any traffic. It's only, only new releases and they only get downloaded once from from the origin, which is, has been fantastic. I've been very happy with that uh, setup so far. And I, it's, it helps everyone because it's faster downloads around the world for people, faster security updates because it's near instant like purge on Fastly if there's a security update for something. Um, so that's, that was another uh, kind of project, big win uh, that we had on our roadmap, so. Yeah, and we're also uh, in the near future going to start using the static servers for our, our static content, like the Drupal files directory. Uh, so we can put that in a different domain, and that'll be a little bit more secure. Yeah, and there's a, I believe, a dev server up right now with kind of a, it links to DrupalContent.org, which is a new domain, and that's that's routed through Fastly, kind of the same way as uh, all this, the updates in FTP work. So. Uh, that files directory for Drupal.org and potentially for the subsites uh, does Drupal content serves it up and there's no like you know cross site exploit yeah ability. less less places to cross site scripting inject stuff um, but yeah we just need to well we need to figure out the the usual things like advanced aggregator expects to get hit Drupal or the files uh, image styles ex expect to hit Drupal if uh, things don't exist. So hopefully this, well, you know, it, it always changes, but that's kind of uh, the priorities right now. Um, so moving on to pre-production infrastructure history. Um, oh, that slide got messed up. Well, this slide doesn't really matter. Um, 
it's kind of gone ad hoc to more standardized and more um, automated. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so a very, very long time ago, um, right after the OSL kind of took on uh, hosting Drupal.org, uh, there needed to be a way to not just edit files in production, which was kind of what happened a very, very, very long time ago. There was nowhere to stage. There was nowhere to develop things. Um, so two VMs got created. Um, there was a Scratch VM, uh, and that came first. It was like just, you know, let's take Drupal.org, like dump the database, put it somewhere, and like do the edits. That worked. Um, and then it was kind of like, well, you know, more more people want to work on Drupal.org. Okay, let's let's make a like a server and let's call it staging VM and let's do dev there. <laughs> not not confusing at all. <laughs> this lasted much, much longer than it should have. Um, <laughs> um, so this is you know, this is kind of how it started. So there there was this work. Uh, people were doing work here. Uh, they existed. There was a place to kind of test things, but there wasn't a, a ton of change happening at Drupal.org. It was all, I, Neil, you weren't, were you contributing when this was? Uh, yeah, I was a volunteer mostly working on api.drupal.org in this era. Um, did we still use this for the so the uh, redesign. Yeah, there are the big projects like the redesign, Drupal.org redesign and uh, Git uh, migration and uh, the Drupal 7 upgrade. Like we would set up the infrastructure we needed for each project. And that's and where this it, came from, actually. It, like it, this gets next... a bit better each time. And now we have. This is kind of what came out yeah. of the redesign back in 2011 was this. Uh, we have a bunch of contractors working on different parts of the site. They all need separate dev environments. What do we do? And it's like, oh, well, we just started using Jenkins. Maybe it can do stuff. And it, it does. You just give it bash, and it does stuff. So we had a bunch of Jenkins jobs that were just ended up turning into like really long bash scripts um, that would kind of make a dev environment like for solar work or a dev environment for like performance work or a dev environment for you know whatever we were doing. Uh, on the redesign with the different teams. So there were you know, multiple dev environments. And it worked um, for a while. Um, and then redesign launched, and all the, all the contractors went away, and Neil remained. And really, like, the system, the sort of, like, ideas of that system remain in place today, but the bash scripts are all managed in Git. The, uh, like, adding new sites is a very, like, very clean process, and it, it's worked very, very well, and it's scaled up uh, significantly since then. So um, we moved the, the pre-production infrastructure has moved uh, quite a bit. It was on the open source lab uh, Zen server that they had. So they had like Zen set up, staging uh, VM and scratch VM were there, and then the open source lab, you know, we're still uh, volunteering time, volunteers, like, they had virtual machines. They were like, okay, we're moving to Gennetti, which is a Google project using KVM. Um, they moved there. Uh, and then we had money to buy VM1. So we moved things to VM1, uh, running OpenStack. And they were there until May or April. I don't remember when I moved things. I think it was, but yeah, May, one of those. It was, yeah. it was a few months ago. Uh, we decided, hey, EC2 would make this a lot easier and and faster, and maybe it'll give us some more flexibility with like snapshotting disks and you know not having to manage OpenStack and and all those things. So we kind of like rearchitected slightly how the how the pre-production worked, but it mostly moved it off to EC2. So now we have uh, EC2 with a separate domain to prevent cross-site scripting stuff, um, dev 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 one, dev db one, dev solar one, so there's a solar server now for dev work that didn't exist before. Uh, staging now has uh, all integrated staging dev dev one, db, solar, and git, um, which didn't exist before either. There was like a separate sort of site for git work, it, VM for was, git work. Yeah, it was one of those one-offs. It, it was like the contractor started. and sometimes and, worked. Yeah, so that and that was another one where like the contracting work started and then they stopped and it just kind of was there, 
um, but we weren't really using it or keeping it up to date. So that got implemented, and then after that, uh, we needed another part of this workflow, uh, which was integration. So now we have a place where we can we can sort of pre-stage and integrate like some work, test it, make sure it works, continue working on other things so we're not locked on kind of that workflow process. And Neil, I, I mean, you can probably explain that better than I can. It's kind of how that... Um, not, but Ryan can explain it better than I can. <laughs> which, 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 it's a panel, uh, people. Um, <laughs> Tim, you know about this, right? <laughs> Tatiana, you, you wanted me to do it, right? What? You know about it. <laughs> integration? What is integration? Ah. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, integration is another uh, copy of staging. No, we're not serious. <laughs> I'm on the panel. You are on the panel. <laughs> Don't talk Remember that panel. Give her a microphone. Give me a microphone. <laughs> so integration is a copy of production where we can integrate different work from different developers and see how it affects each other because before that we only had dev environments and then staging and then production and staging is like the very last step if you get something staging it will go in production there's no way to like easily roll it back essentially so for big changes like we do right now for organic groups for example we need a place to play with it and see if it won't break things before we actually are ready to deploy it does it make sense? yeah we're doing things like uh uh, that's probably what you're going to say, like installing uh, XHProf uh, on all the pre pre-production infrastructure and making sure all of the fun developer tools are, are ready to go. Yeah, because uh, integration being actually on bare metal and not on a VM, we do performance tests there as well so we can get you know solid baselines and make sure that this new module stack that we're going to deploy isn't going to take down Drupal.org. And, and yeah, it'll probably work with your IDE out of the box if uh, if, if that's uh, the way you work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that that's integration, um, and that's actually this is going to be confusing. That is actually running on VM one right now, um, and the reason for that was to have a more stable sort of environment to do those XH prop tests and know that like this is a this system is dedicated for this, and there's not some other EC2 instance running on on that actual node that's affecting the performance, or they you know, might run an XH prop test uh, with one thing and then run it again, and it's like, oh, it's drastically different. But it, that's because the RDS instance or something on on Amazon was bogged down, or there was some snapshot happening somewhere, or is some other outside factor affecting that. So that's there now. I don't know if it will stay there. Um, forever or where it will go. We have, we have some other, like, it could go on util, um, which might be better because VM1 is uh, very bored right now. Like, it's it's meant to run many virtual machines, and it's really just running one thing right now. So uh, it has, just to throw out some hardware specs, uh, VM1 has 32 cores and 120 gig of RAM and, like, RAID 10, 15K disks, and it's running, like, one site that we run some tests on right now. So it's kind of <laughs> underutilized. Um, so that might move. Um, and this this will change, and we haven't really known how to change it from here. Uh, this is still sort of that same architecture that we put together back in the redesign days. Um, and it, it works for us, like at the Drupal Association, but we've been trying to figure out how to make it better for contributors and volunteers. So um, Tatiana? <laughs> So they invited me because someone needed to complain about their environment, so I can do that. Um, <laughs> our two biggest uh, historical problems with the dev environments are that they are firstly not complete copy of production, so some things are missing completely, <laughs> like Git. Good job. Sorry. Uh, We did rehearse that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so some things like Git are missing. Essentially, if you want to develop a new feature for our Git thing, you can't use dev environments for that, so you can do it sort of locally, then deploy and hope it won't break anything, which is not ideal. And then uh, things like Solar, 
we have them on dev environments, but it's sort of very tricky and slow and not easy to connect your dev environment so you are able to actually work with it. And the second big problem is mostly the time it takes to sanitize the database and uh, essentially deploy a new dev environment. It, it's getting a little bit better. It used to be three hours, now it's one hour, but one hour is also not really <laughs> uh, ideal. So we are supposed to discuss how to fix it because we don't have answer yet. Right, Rudy? Right. Tell me when to change the slide. No. <laughs> so, uh, ideas here. Like, I, if anyone has any suggestions on how to do that, I mean, it's pie in the sky thing. Um, we've had some ideas internally, but we don't really know like how how important are dev environments to to people. Like, what what can we use to make them better? Is it is it Docker? Is it is it in Amazon? We have an AMI that gets built that has all of these things integrated into like a single VM. Is it is it solvable, or is it like is the current architecture just kind of what we need to live with and and use? Um, Brandon. Solar, I would recommend. Oh, oh, there's a mic, right? Yeah, That'd be a great time to use the mic. Good job. Yeah, uh, for for solar, I would highly recommend running it in cloud mode and using the REST APIs. Um, it makes it so easy to 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 just pop uh, toss another core up. And, and you know, destroy core that you're not using, whatever it's. It okay. makes it trivial. Okay, um, and that, I mean, would we run that, like in the kind of current architecture, would we run that on on like a, a VM that's a solar cloud VM, or do we run multiple VMs with solar I cloud? Would just, I would just run one Okay. Um, for for all the dev environments and uh, makes it, you know, makes it a lot easier to, you, you just, you know, you tune the whole thing once and then you just, yeah, that, that so makes sense because we're the, we're only the, actively developing on solar on like at most two development environments at a time and uh, read only for everything else. Cool. So Thank that you. would just be a separate core. Yeah, There'd be one separate, core, separate core, core for each dev that needed anything that needs changes. To be isolated from everything else. Cool. Um, a quick question, Neil, about like if someone wanted to help with packaging or how packaging works. Is that something they can do on the dev environments or is that something that needs Jenkins to? Uh, packaging is a, it's a drush command and uh, because we took the get away from the web nodes file system, uh, that means you don't need it on dev either. So you don't need get for packaging. It does everything. Uh, it, it, checks out, it clones the package from the Git servers. So yeah, it's, you just have to know the drush command and um, you know, expect or know how it, how it runs. Cool, I'm gonna switch uh, images here. It's, it's distracting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very distracting. Holly wanted her cat. Well, yeah, we need to explain yeah. this slide. Oh. Okay, go, go Tatiana. Essentially, they gave me a slide and said I can do whatever I want, and our executive director was passing by. She really wanted to see her cat in the presentation, so that's Holly's cat, just so everyone knows. And she didn't even show up to our presentation. <laughs> that's <laughs> depressing, but... <laughs> <laughs> She's seen her cat before. <laughs> so um, you mentioned the, there's the time lag, the three hours down to one hour time delay. What is, do you know where the bottleneck is there? What's causing it to take that long to, to happen? Uh, it's basically uh, our sync the database dump over from uh, where it is and loading it into MySQL. So, yeah, some sort of uh, what's the best parallel database restore thing nowadays? Oh, okay. I, I was just wondering, you know, would it, would it save time to have a nightly sanitized pr process? Yeah, yeah, or the like yeah. pre baked a yeah. AMI or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's, so that's kind of what I was about. we so we sanitize nightly. Like nightly, there's a snapshot that happens from like the production database slave, and that gets moved over to dbutil, uh, which is like a very isolated, unused um, in production thing that only does sanitization right now. So that it goes from like nightly, it goes from production to dbutil, and then dbutil runs a like a staging snapshot sanitization. Uh, and then also runs like a whitelist sanitization for for dev environments, and that gets sanitized and packaged up and 
exported to an rsync module on dbutil that the dev server can can grab. Uh, so the dev server is really like when we deploy a dev environment, it is rsyncing that from dbutil and restoring it into a database. And that just the amount of content, it, the data that's there to restore takes with MySQL single thread, you know, MySQL dump import essentially about an hour. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it sounds to me like you know something like an image where you just generate the image periodically, and then it seems like spinning up from an image is going to be faster than trying to rsync. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I definitely would. Or what about using stupid ZFS tricks? Well, <laughs> that's that's come up. So um, Archie, who's not here, I'll speak for him though. Um, was looking into doing some like ButterFS things like that, like a ButterFS snapshot, like send receive type thing, um, and almost got it working. But it's it's ButterFS. Um, it would probably work better with ZFS. And uh, you know, in the production infrastructure, oh, in the production infrastructure, <laughs> <laughs> um, we're using FreeBSD now in places, and we're trying to get sort of like we've upgraded from CentOS five to CentOS six. Uh, the next upgrade that we're seeing for that is to go to FreeBSD, um, and then we'll have ZFS support, and we could maybe do something like that where we the snapshot is actually there's still that like manual process of importing the data in the single thread, but then we snap it and we can send that yeah. snapshot around. Well, or or just uh, have those be uh, origin points for clone file systems. That, that's a great idea too. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. More, more input, this is, this is great. <laughs> Docker, yay, nay. I just need a <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, really, like, for dev environments, does it make sense for a hosted dev environment to use that? Why? Why does it make sense? Mike, it. <laughs> I think that's why I'm a DevOps because I'm lazy. <laughs> uh, so yeah, because it's it's basically ephemeral. So all of the things that you want to just touch and go, you can just throw them away later. So it's not trash that you leave on your shop, and that's why it should be a very good. Uh, option to have like containers that you can just use for development okay and for and for other testing not not the Drupal core testing but for other kind of testing and would it I mean if we had like a docker our own like registry where we like is that kind of how it would work where we like snapshot like we have a docker well, image that's the latest database I don't know are you guys going to have a, the the registry that we talked about some were in the past still possible still yeah still possible okay. it would you know we have static one and static two now for doing you, that sort of thing you actually could can can as long as you don't have keys and stuff that's uh for for the drupal association you can use the the docker hub right but when you're starting to have images that are related <laughs> only to the work that you do internally yes uh probably the registry makes more sense and Mesos, but that's another conversation. I would move all of that to Mesos. What, what all of that? those machines, to, all of those machines would be just one huge grid. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and, and we do try to have, uh, you know, the reason we're doing a whitelist database sanitization, that means if a new table gets added, we don't put it in the database for uh, dev sites until it's explicitly added. Uh, so. Uh, as far as we know, everything's secure and will stay secure as far as, like, disclosing information uh, through, our, uh, through our snapshots. Uh, but we're not, quite, we're not quite ready to say that, like, absolutely we got everything because that's – we want to be able to pull things if we were like, oh, that, that person's email address is in the mm. – and yeah. we're, we're grappling for all the email addresses, but... Well, yeah. I don't know. Uh, the amount of work that gives to create a, a registry is not so big, but depends on the time that's available to do that. 
So it all depends on time that is free for that. Uh, as me, as I'm, I'm, I'm a volunteer, it's exactly the same thing. The, the, the time, for instance, in, in that, that's why I asked about util. If you guys have the things exactly on the same place, I don't have to waste more time to figure out, well, how am I going to go do whatever I was doing before? Um, because it's in the same place. So that time is not wasted. And the same thing for the registry. If, if you guys have time to build the registry, you do just do that and then it's, it's a thing that you guys have for a long time. Uh, but it only makes sense if you're going to use Docker. So, yeah, it's kind of a circle. <laughs> okay, great. Cool. Well, thanks. Um, next up, uh, Drupal CI. Yeah, in the uh, last few months, we've gone from uh, a Drupal 8 Accelerate course, or Drupal 8 Accelerate Sprint in Portland to kind of pull together all of the different disparate pieces of the Drupal CI architecture and move it forward to where it's now deployed in production. And pretty much next week, very soon, we're going to be shutting off Piff to Piffer. We're going to be using Drupal CI exclusively. And I just want to give a real quick overview of what that means. And uh, as you can see from the slide, there's lots of clouds. Um, it's Drupal.org is currently communicating with um, a uh, our CI, our Jenkins CI instance, which is our dispatcher, and that spins up EC2 bots that then run all the tests, and those those tests are running inside of Docker containers on those bots. And so, um, it's really flexible in that we're able to um, kind of do things on demand and not have to maintain the bots anymore. Because uh, if you go to the go to the next slide, Rudy, yes. let's talk a little bit about. More, more in detail. So on the Drupal.org UI side of things, um, it's creating, oh, is this yours, Neil? Uh, sure. Yeah, this was yours. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, re I reused the project issue file test module. Uh, so we just wouldn't have to redo all the rules of like the patch has to be named this, but not named this, and has to be in these, this has to be in these conditions. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the new stuff, it's a little bit more modern. We're using a, a new entity, and uh, uh, entities are actually too slow for the individual line items. That's the job result. Uh, like, this one test out of, how many tests do we have? Like 5,000, 12,000? That's in my next slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's uh, old, old school table that we use uh, and yeah more drush commands um, to kind of push things back and forth into the Jenkins API and pull it out of the Jenkins API uh, and uh, yeah we added daily tests which we didn't have before so that's another uh, drush command that we run once a day um, yeah cool So yeah, the um, once it hits the Jenkins dispatcher, we're using the uh, Jenkins EC2 plugin, which uh, is kind of being renamed to the Cloud plugin soon. But it's there; it it auto scales EC2 AMIs, and so every time a job comes into Jenkins, like we need a new test, it looks for a, an executor, and if an executor doesn't exist, it'll spin up a new EC2 instance, and you tell it which AMI you want it to spin up and which job you want to run on that uh, executor, and so that's allowing us to, like. We haven't had to, normally during a DrupalCon or during a sprint or during, you know, some time where there's a high level of activity, we're always on the hook to spin up new bots and get them all configured and get them all ready to go. And then when it's over, we've got to tear them all down so we're not paying for them. And this has actually allowed the system to just scale based on demand and just, we have more bots, then we have less bots. And sometimes at three in the morning, there's no bots. And so, and because we're able to do this using spot instances, we're not paying nearly as much for executing a lot more tests. And so, um, and because we're using Jenkins, it's already got a really robust API built into it for all of its results. It's a JSON API, so it made it relatively easy for Neil to consume all that data. Uh, so, and 
So far, yeah, there's been 17,500 tests as of yesterday that we've ran in the last two and a half months. That's 17,500 tests in two and a half months. So it's, um, it's, it's moving pretty quick. And then as soon as we flip on everything for contrib, we're probably expecting to see a lot more. And um, in the future, we'd like to be able to get it to where we're using something like Docker Compose so that the developers that are running their tests are able to de provide a YAML file to define the environment they want it to run in because a lot of the things we're seeing now is that Drupal Core is like, oh, everything works great, except if I put it in front of behind Varnish, then the header negotiation doesn't seem to work right. But we don't have a testing infrastructure that can support that right now. So um, those sorts of things, there's so many environment dependencies. You know, if, if you're running search and you're running solar, we don't have anything testing that right now. So how do we know that our solar integration works with search API on Drupal core? So we want to be able to get to where we can have, you know, different front caching, different, you know, are you using APC or are you using APCU or are you using opcache or not opcache or do you have certain Peckle uh, modules installed or not? So that would allow the developers to define the environment that they want to test in. And so that's kind of the direction we'd like to move in. So, um, Next slide, yes. Okay. And then the the test runner itself, um, it when the when the test gets to the EC2 uh, test runner, it's basically got four main steps. It's happening. It it sets up the containers and pulls down everything that it needs to. To depending on whether it's a MySQL test or a PHP test, there's two containers. There's the executor container and the and the service container that work in conjunction with each other. It prepares the code base, it gets whatever patches it needs, and it checks out whatever things it needs to clone in. And then it kicks off whatever jobs need to be ran. And this, in this case, it's the simple test jobs run tests, but we'd like to be able to add additional jobs in the future, and it's flexible enough now that we can do that, where we can add, oh, we want to run an XH prof performance comparisons, or we want to run code coverage. And so we'll be able to do all that using the, the test runner infrastructure. Finally, the last step is just post-processing whatever output comes out of those tests because right now we're turning them into XML so that Jenkins can consume them properly so that it feeds the API all the way back down the list. And that's pretty much how they work, from real high level. And So yeah. <clears throat> um, any any questions or comments about Drupal CI stuff? I know it's been, been running. I don't know if anyone here is actively involved or wants to be um, in kind of what's going on there, but... Um, yeah, if there's no comments, I'll, I'll move on to the plan of review. All right. Um, so we put together a plan kind of for the beginning of the year and on things we want to continue to work on uh, with the infrastructure. Um, and we've completed quite a few of them so far um, since the year is pretty, pretty far gone. Um, so there was the FTP downloads migration away from the FTP mirrors, uh, moving Git to highly available cl cluster, um, unblocking like D8 on Drupal CI work, um, and then decoupling from managed hosting services. So we've, we're basically done with CF Engine and centralized logging that OSL is providing, and we've got our own, you know, puppet, our own modules that uh, do kind of the full stack instead of this mishmash of CF Engine and, and puppet. Um, and centralized logging, we now have log host with uh, our syslog running uh, on all of our servers, and we have a central place to look at our logs, uh, which, which has been great. Um, we're continuing the puppet thing. There's three servers left that are being, like, Services are being migrated off of them, so we're not going to actually upgrade them. Um, they're they're being kind of shifted around uh, internally. Those are uh, DB3, which like DB DB5 and 6 have enough capacity for that. So the the sites uh, for groups, which is actually the next uh, kind of how we're going to manage the groups migration update thing. Um, that's going to be the only thing left there. Uh, QA is going to get shut down. That's the other the other site that's running there. So. No point in upgrading DB3. Everything will be on DB5, DB6. Um, <clears throat> Util, same thing. Um, Util still has some CF Engine uh, stuff there, and it's still running CentOS 5. Uh, it, the services running there now are just Mailman and Jenkins. Those will get migrated off into virtual machines. So just kind of those projects will cause this thing to kind of get finished. So it's in progress, but it's, it's nearly complete. Um, decoupling for managed hosting services. Uh, we still have LDAP and DNS. Uh, that are in progress. Um, we have Puppet doing some user management in pre-production, but not in production yet. So that's probably the direction we'll go, but haven't kind of finalized that decision yet. Um, and DNS, 
we don't have a huge urgency to move it, but we have um, Route 53 in AWS since we have the pre-production stuff there um, configured and like as, as a basically as a DNS uh, slave right now, but it's not active for the actual like DNS updates. Uh, so that's kind of in the in progress. Um, kind of want to want to know how much that's going to cost before we cut the switch on that. Um, and revamping pre-production, um, you know, that's we've made progress there, but there's still, as we said, like more to do. Um, and then also improve infrastructure documentation. Um, we have a Bitbucket uh, infrastructure wiki uh, that's there that has some documentation, but not everything. Um, and pages on Drupal.org that have some documentation, but not completely up to date. So there's there's stuff that's been done there, but it's not finished. Um, and then in the queue, private network is the big next thing. Um, that's a lot of work. There's, a, you know, that will require like time in the data center, re-networking things and coordinating with our hosting provider at the open source lab, um, figuring that out. So that that's mostly what's going to be next. Um, and then there's some things that we haven't really fleshed out yet, which are like SMTP, SMTP relays. OSL provides them now. Um, do we continue using them or not? I, I don't know yet. Um, backups are another thing, like they're working, uh, they're kind of lower priority, so we haven't gotten to them yet. Uh, the next the next thing there is the CDN migration. So we mentioned DrupalContent.org um, moving to Fastly and using that as like another place for static files um, so that users can't upload exploits, essentially, um, on the Drupal.org domain. Yeah, um, well, they can, but they won't do anything. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. Yeah, there's still exploits. Yeah. They just don't do anything. <laughs> um, and then moving uh, Drupal.org and subsites uh, to a new CDN, which is Fastly. So we have Edgecast right now uh, hosting or fronting Drupal.org and all the subsites. Um, it would be great to get kind of, we kind of got our feet wet with Fastly uh, doing like static file hosting stuff and we're very impressed with them, but still had a contract to fulfill with Edgecast. So once that contract is up, we can move those sites to Fastly and start doing cool things with Fastly because it gives us the kind of custom VCL we can do, and we might be able to start doing more um, like authenticated user uh, caching and you know, fast purging and, and things like that that'll let us cache more of the site. Because right now it's a very, uh, it's basically caching the Drupal content.org content and things like CSS and, and JavaScript and, and stuff like that, but no actual like user pages or doing things like edge site includes that Fastly gives us the option to do. So. Uh, that's that's what's coming up next, um, and then like uh, we'll be sprinting Friday. I don't know what on uh, myself, but uh, there you know I'm always there. Um, if you want to work on infrastructure things, that's a great time to just see if you want to get involved in something or yeah, just discuss. Yeah, there's Drupal CI stuff on all levels of that stack, and yes, yeah, and Drupal CI will be like that's uh, Ryan and Neil mostly, and I also know how it works, but like. If if you want to get involved, like they're the ones to talk to. Um, <laughs> awesome. So yeah, Drupal CI sprinting would be fantastic. So there's there's more work to do there, uh, and there's more work to do in infrastructure, but it's probably more of a discussion than a sprint at this point. So <laughs> awesome. Um, so yeah, uh, evaluate the session. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, there's time for questions if anyone has them. We're at time right now. Oh, but we're at time? There's not time for questions. Well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jacob's All right. Here, so. Jacob, right. do you have any questions? <laughs> nice work. <laughs> Thank you. Good job, buddy. Oh, there's a question. Uh, so in general, you're moving away from the LDAP just because of the administration overhead? Uh, we haven't moved off LDAP yet. Uh, were we? Well, we want to run our own LDAP. We we still aren't sure about LDAP. Um, we might run our own LDAP, and that would you know live on that VM kind of infrastructure, and we could do that, or we could use the the puppet management there. Um, there's some overhead there, and it's kind of you know we kind of need to pick a system and and no. stick with it. And puppet user management is not great for Terrible. actual users, so. <laughs> yeah, I, it's unknown. 
right now. Um, the, the reason we want to move away from the OSL LDAP is because we're in the same tree as all of the other OSL LDAP accounts. So, and that's just confusing. I'm the only one that really has access to enter LDAP accounts right now, which is like, I have to be the user guy, which isn't good. Um, so if we do choose to do LDAP, uh, it would be our own LDAP. We'd have to kind of pull our entries out of that LDAP tree and move them and then update everything and, and do that. So there would be some work there, but it's definitely possible and, and still an option. And when we moved our pre-production to AWS, we were like, well, we could set up LDAP out here or let's just use the Puppet stuff for now. So that was kind of an interim solution. Cool. Thanks. Yep.